Hello everyone, uh, my name is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and today we continue with the experiment design for computer sciences course, uh, topic 4, paired comparison. So before we begin, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the last classes, oh sorry, the outline for this lecture. So in the last lecture, we studied how to use hypothesis testing to perform induction uh, on the value of a population parameter. So we saw that, oh, we have a, pro uh, we have a process that is generating some product and we want to see if the, the value of, let's say, the average of the result of this process is below a certain number of interest. So we can say like, okay, we have a target time and we must run our algorithm under that target time. And we can use sample to compare the running time of our algorithm against that type target time. So that was the one sample testing. Now, very commonly in research, we also have the cases of two sample testings, testing between two different quantities. For example, if we're talking about drug development, it's very common when you are developing a drug and you're trying to test its uh, efficiency to compare it against a placebo. Why a placebo? Because if you get two groups and to one group you give the, gr the drug, the testing drug, and to the other group you give nothing, there is a very no well-known effect that is the placebo effect that if you, the, 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 the group that you give the medicine will get better even if the medicine does nothing if, it, if it's just like a small candy that you say it's medicine they will get better because they believe they're taking medicine so what happens is that we separate into groups and we give one of the groups the real medicine and the other group we give the candy saying that it's medicine so by doing this we eliminate the placebo effect so we're comparing the two groups Another thing, another, another experiment that we see often in computer science is comparing a new algorithm against the old one. So you have, let's say, a new neural network or a new evolutionary algorithm or a new network protocol. And you don't want to compare against the target value. You want to compare against a different algorithm. So it's two populations, right? And your question is, is the performance of these two algorithms the same? Or if we think about statistics, as we discussed in the last two classes, do, does the performance of both algorithms come from the same population or not? Okay. Uh, sometimes you also see something like called A-B testing, where you have, for instance, two website designs. You have the design for two interfaces, and you test one interface and the other different the interface with different people, and you want to compare uh, which interface people are like more most okay so this comparison between two quantities is the topic for today's lecture so today we're going to describe how to do the hypothesis testing that we did last class when we have two quantities before we begin uh, i want to comment on reporter number one so thank you very much i received 22 uh reports i think we have a few more students then that if you did not submit a report send me an email as soon as possible uh but anyway uh grading these reports will take a little bit of time maybe i'll have time to grade this weekend maybe next week but i really gave a quick look over most of the reports in general the topics were very interesting a lot of people did reports about their own research uh there were some people doing reports on other topics uh, there were a few mistakes that were common, even on this quick look. The first one is that quite a few people did not include code for reproducibility. And I think I made it very clear when I described the report that it's very important that you start to learn that when you publish code, when you publish a, a paper, uh, you need to publish reproducibility data. So for your second report and for your third report, don't forget to add the data that you use for the analysis, for generating tables, for generating figures, okay? Uh, second, a few students did not submit the report in PDF. One student only submitted the markdown, and markdown is really nice, but uh, I need the PDF because 
in case I cannot run your markdown, the PDF will be your official report. So in case I cannot replicate your code, I need the PDF to know what you wanted to write. Okay, so don't forget to submit the PDF in your report. There was one student that submitted data from his experiment and said, look, uh, I submitted data from the experiment, but this data is secret and I don't want it to be released. And he's okay, okay, of course, I will not release. But if you are worried about your experimental data being secret, maybe it's not a good idea to submit it in a report, okay? Um, I mean, using, uh, you can of course do this for yourself. You can use, you can make yourself, but if you submit to Manaba, um, I don't know, maybe there is a problem with Manaba or I don't know. So uh, let's try to use only open data in the reports, okay? Um, also, one thing that I noticed is that when I do this course, you notice that this, these lectures are actually quite short. This is why, that, that's what, uh, the reason for this is that when I give it presential, uh, the students ask lots of questions. Oh, I did not understand this calculation. Oh, I did not understand what uh, hypothesis mean. I don't understand what population means. Now, of course, it's very difficult to, for you to make questions when I'm talking to a video and you are only listening, but we have some avenues for questions. Uh, we have Manaba, there is a forum in Manaba. Uh, you can ask questions to me by email, okay? Uh, there's a TA that's going to answer questions in Manaba also. So make sure that if you don't understand something, uh, you ask questions, uh, you ask questions, okay? Because if you don't understand, uh, the course will start to get more complicated because for instance, this, this lecture is all based on the last lecture. And the next lecture will be based on this lecture. So if you don't understand, if you did not understand lecture number three, you will not understand lecture number four and you will not understand lect lecture number five. So make sure that you understand things completely um, and ask questions if you don't, okay? All right, uh, let's start with the, let's start with the class. So the, we, this class is divided in two parts. The first one is two sample testing and the second one is pair testing. Now pair testing is a specific type of two sample testing. Uh, so let's study both of them together. So uh, sometimes, like I said before, we are interested in the comparison between two different populations. And we get samples from these two populations and we want to estimate the values of the two populations. This is normal, is, this is very frequent when we compare effects of two different two, two different techniques and if you're reading a statistic book uh, you will usually heard the word treatment the word treatment here you should understand is as different techniques it comes from medicine so you have maybe treatment a and treatment b uh, um, drug a and drug b uh, but for us here we're thinking about techniques okay so we are comparing two te one technique against a control group a placebo or maybe a new technique against an old technique for if you're using algorithms that do search evolutionary computation or um, uh, Markov uh, types of algorithms um, if you're doing neural networks it's usually very useful to compare your algorithm against Reynolds search okay uh, because sometimes uh, comparing against, if you compare against old, older techniques, uh, maybe the difference is very small and you don't know actually how good is the algorithm. If you compare against a random search or like, what, what would happen if this algorithm did not exist? That would be something very interesting to know, okay? Now, you will notice that the statistics, which means the calculations that we are going to do, they are very similar to the statistics that we used for the analysis of the civil population. The key difference is about how we describe our population and how we describe our uh, variable of interest. In other words, the difference is on the experimental design. So by changing the experimental design in the right way, we can use the same statistics to get us many different kinds of information. The opposite side of that coin is that errors 
in your experimental design will tell you completely different things from what you expected. So you need to be very careful when you choose your, uh, your, stati your statistical test, okay? Now, what usually we want to know is we want to compare the means of some variable or we want to compare the variables, let's, uh, the, the variances. So we have two methods that they, uh, they perform about the same level of performance, but we want to say that method A is more robust than method B. To represent this robustness, we can say that method A maybe has a lower variance than method B. So they have the same performance, but method A changes less. And for some applications, that's very important. It's more important to have always a very stable value than to have a value that changes a lot. Okay, so that's why sometimes we don't want to compare the mean performance, we want to compare the variance of the performance. Uh, also, we all can also have sometimes the proportions. So a comparison with proportions happens when your algorithm is not tr trying to find some performance, but it's trying to solve some problem. Let's say, for example, you have an algorithm that wants to detect if a graph is connected or non-connected. So that's a yes, no answer. So maybe you run your algorithm on 400 graphs and you manage to get the correct answer in 350 of them. So you got about 80% uh, of uh, correctness. And a different algorithm got maybe 90% of correctness. Now, you don't want to compare the means of these, okay? Because you have a maximum value, you have a minimum value, you have limits. So the means, the, the normal will be affected by these means. So you're more interested in comparing the proportions in this case, okay? So you have to think about this. Uh, today, we're gonna only to talk about the comparison of means, but if you search for uh, tests of variances or tests of, of, of proportions, you're gonna find the calculations very easily. And the important thing that is the experiment design will be very similar. So let's talk about an example comparing means. So the example we're gonna go here is the length of steel rods, okay? And this is very interesting because we're going to compare the means not of the steel rod, but the means of the difference. So let's see this example. So here are our, our cases that we have a manufacturer of steel rods, so we need to manufacture these rods for our construction, okay? And the idea is that we have to cut the bar with a precise length. So we have to cut the bar with exactly the desired, desired size. So the desired size is defined. We want a rod with exactly one meter. Of course, cutting the rod is imprecise. So maybe it's a few millimeters more or a few millimeters less, okay? So this project is prone to errors. We result in additional costs. If the, if, the, if the size is different, we have to adjust the pieces. So that will be costly, okay? So it has to reprocess the rods with this. If the size is too big, we have to throw it away and melt it down. So we want to minimize this error. So what we want to minimize here is how much the process differs from the target value. So we have an engineer here that wants to compare the current method, and here we are, the current method for cutting the rods with a new method that would reduce this error, okay? So the first thing that we have to do is to define a statistical model. So what is a statistical model? A statistical model is how we describe the population in terms of statistics, okay? So remember, we have a population that is all possible uh, rods that could be produced on this project, and the probability that each size of rod is, comes out, Okay, and then we observe some sample. Observing the sample is like, okay, so let's produce 50 rods and see how many, uh, what's the size of each of them. Now the statistical model will describe what are the possible values that this sample could have given the population and what, how they are distributed. Okay, so it's a model about how the samples are generated. Usually this model describes the value, some value of interest. So we're gonna call this Y. Y is the value of interest. And we have two methods, right? We have I equal to one and I equal to two. Method one and method two. Now, we know that for each method, the values of Y, the length of the rods, they come from a distribution with a mean, okay? And this mean will be mu I. 
So we have mu u and mu two. So y one comes from mu one, and y two comes from mu two. Right. Um, also, because every sample, every observation, every time we take an observation, the value will be a little bit stiffer. It will be sometimes a little bit bigger than mu, sometimes a little bit smaller than mu. Okay. So we call this the error epsilon. So now that we have the y, the i1 and i2, the mu and the epsilon, we can describe uh, our, our statistical model. So y i j, so the variable y, the variable that we are measuring, for the method i, for the observation j, the value of i is mu plus epsilon. So mu is the mean. So this is the mean of method i. If there was no error, the value of y would always be mu, okay? Because there's no error, it's always the same value. But there's an error, and this error is this epsilon, epsilon ij. So now epsilon i, because we are thinking that maybe the error depends on the process. So i is the process. But also epsilon j, because there is an independent error, okay? So this independent error depends only on the observation. Okay, so each row, the each the the value of interest y is based on the mean plus the error. Okay, now we have this model. What can we do with this? So if we think about that, this model will describe our uh, observed variable. We will assume, okay, that the error we are interested in knowing this error, how big it is. We're interested in measuring this error. So we're going to assume that the error is IID, and IID means independent and identically distributed. So independent means that from one, if you, if you produce two rods, the errors are independent. The size of this rod does not, is not related to the size of this rod. So last lecture, we talked a little bit about independence. So here in this model, we are assuming that the errors are independent. If they are dependent, then we cannot use this technique at all. This technique is based on dependence. Also, ID, identically distributed. This means that the errors come all from the same distribution. So in case we comes, the errors for method I comes from this distribution here, and the other method, the, the, the methods for, uh, for method two comes from this distribution. And we are also assuming that the errors follow a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma i squared. So this is our model. The measure of the variable that we are interested, it has a mean and it has an error. And this error follows a normal distribution. Okay? Now, if we assume these things, we can say that the two models, they look like this. We have population one for method one, and we have population two. So we have population one for method one, and we have population two for method two, okay? And I think maybe you can see here how we want to compare. If the two populations are the same, these two distributions, they will be together they will be very close together. If the two populations are different, these two distributions will be apart as they are here. So what we want to know is that we want to look at the samples and we want to estimate where these distributions are. Let's see how we do this. So, okay, so we have this model, but what is why? Okay, so remember that the goal for this experiment is to see if the new method produces steel rods that are closer to the correct value. Because of this, we cannot use the length as the value. If we use the length as the value, uh, both methods, they produce, they aim to produce this method. The difference is not, is not the target value. The target value should be the same. I mean, we are, we are not testing if one method is completely wrong. We're just testing if one method is better than the other. So if both of the methods are not completely wrong, they should be producing the bars with the same size. 
So what we want to know is how far from this perfect size we expect to be. So the idea is that now our y will be the absolute error. So the idea of the absolute error is the average of the difference, the absolute difference between the length of the rod that we produced with one of the methods and the nominal length, the target length. So this is the y, this is our variable of interest for this experiment. For this experiment, we want to know which method has a small error, has the smallest error, okay? So if we think about the statistical model that we described, we can use y as the error and we can build the hypothesis around the mean of this absolute error. So we have this u uh, y i, okay? So in that case, we have new and alternate hypothesis, okay? So the new hypothesis is that the, the, the mean of the error of the old method minus the mean of the method of the new method or mu one minus mu two is equal to zero. Or in other words, the mean of the error of the old method is equal to the mean of the method of the new method. Or, uh, sorry, mu one is the new method, sorry. So the mean, of the, 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 the mean of the new method is equal to the mean of the old method. The alternate hypothesis, the hypothesis that is not conservative, the hypothesis that says, oh, there's something new going on here, is that the new method, the mean of the error of the new method is smaller than the mean of the error of the old method. So here is, we are again with uh, new hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. New hypothesis, the new method and the old method, they have no difference. Alternate hypothesis, the new method has a smaller error than the old method. Now, let's assume for now that we don't know the variance of the process, but we know that the variance is similar for both systems, okay? Since the, variable, since the variance is unknown, you remember from the last class that we estimate the variance from the sample data. Now, last class, we've, we estimated the variance from a, single, uh, from a single sample. But for two samples with the same variance, we have the pooled variance estimator. So the pooled variance estimator will get the error from one sample weighted by the size of that sample and the error from another sample weighted for the size of the sample. So if we have two samples with the same size, it's simply all, both of them together with the same weight. But if we have samples with different, let's say, let's say that N1 and N2 are the same. If N1 and N2 are the same, we're gonna have Let's say, let's say that we have 10 from each. We're gonna have 10 times as one, not nine times as one, plus nine times as two, divided by 18. So it basically is S1 plus S2 divided by two, okay? If the variances are different, sorry, if the sample sizes are different, then we're gonna give more priority to one error or the other. Now, we're not going to discuss how to decide the sample sizes today. There will be one lecture in the future all about sample sizes. So for now, just let's say that we have enough samples and we're gonna use the same sample size for both populations, okay? Now, <clears throat> based on this estimator, now that we have the estimate of the error, we use the T statistic, the same T statistic as we used before, okay? Now the T statistic here will be the T statistic of difference of the means, so we have mean one minus mean two, so mean of the new minus, the difference of the mean of the new and the mean, the, the mean of the old. And you remember that under the new hypothesis, these two are the same, okay? And under the alternate hypothesis, mu one is smaller than mu two. And we also have this estimated mean for the sample. So this is the mean of sample one, and this is the mean of sample two, okay? And this is divided by the estimated error square root the size of the samples. Now, this T statistic, like in the previous lecture, it will come from a T distribution with N1 plus N2 minus two degrees of freedom. So let's put some numbers. Remember that for the experiment design, we have to choose the alpha. 
So we have alpha equals 0.05, 95% confidence on the test, that's the standard value. Also remember that we want to know what is this, the minimal effect of interest. We are not interested if we reject a new hypothesis for one millimeter of difference, that's too little. So we're gonna say that we want to detect any difference larger than 50 centimeters in the error of the steel bar, okay? And we also want a power of 0 0.8. So this is the chance that we will detect, uh, we will reject the new hypothesis if the new hypothesis must be rejected, okay? Now, if we go back to our hypothesis, our new hypothesis is mu one minus mu two is equal to zero. Now, remember that the T statistic is compared against the new hypothesis. So since we are assuming the new hypothesis to be true and we are testing to see if it's false given the data, we can cut this. So this mu one minus mu two here can be cut to zero, okay? Because we are assuming that the new hypothesis is true. So our T statistic becomes simply the mean of sample number one minus the mean of sample number two divided by the error multiplied by a proportion of the of the samples and this is distributed under a t distribution with n1 plus n2 degrees of freedom now because we want a confidence level of 0 0.05 then our rejection threshold is the alpha divided by two um is the alpha divided by two um percentile of the t distribution okay actually i think it's just the alpha percentile here because this is a one-sided comparison so i'll check this later so um let's see here so we can to the test uh when we are running this on r it is the same t-test and that's the interesting thing okay so first we're gonna read the tables read table so here is the table that we are using so as you can see we have a csv but without the commas uh, so we have the old process and we have the length of the error so you can see 17 centimeters 17 centimeters 17 centimeters etc and we have the new process and we have 0 06 centimeters, 0 07, then we have this difference. So we can see that the new process seems, the error seems to be smaller than the old process. So we want to see this, okay? So we do the test and here is the big difference, right? Instead of just giving the data, we give Y length error explained by Y process. So this explained by, and when I say explained by, I say this styled here in R, it means explained R by. So here I'm telling t-test that to do a t-test on this data, but know that the variable process explain the variable error. So the function will know that in process, I have two factors, old and new, and I will separate the errors based on these two factors, okay? My alternative is less, so I'm interested to see if the new process is smaller than the old process. And my mean is zero. So my, uh, my, uh, my um, new hypothesis is that the difference between the means is zero, okay, as we said before. Uh, the variance is the same. So we are assuming that the variance is the same for both. And the confidence level is 0 0.95. And then we can see the calculation here. So we can see that our T value was minus 14, okay? Degrees of freedom is 32. And if you remember, the degrees of freedom is size of the sample one plus size of the sample two minus two. So this means that we have 17 samples for each. And we can see here we have 17 samples for the old and 70 samples for the new, okay? And by using this, from this data, we see that our p-value is 9 to the e to the minus 16. So our p-value is much lower than 0 0.05. So this indicates that we can reject the new hypothesis, okay? So we reject the new hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis that the difference of the means is smaller than zero. 
And now the confidence interval for the difference is somewhere between minus infinite and minus seven. So we don't know uh, how big is this, conf is this difference, but we know that the difference is at least seven centimeters. And now here's something. The difference is at least seven centimeters, but we were interested in a difference of 15 centimeters. So this difference is not as much as we are. There is a difference, but maybe this difference is not so important, okay? Now, after we did the test, we need to validate the assumptions that we are doing, okay? So we have three assumptions that we did in this experiment. The first assumption is that the residuals, the errors, they follow a normal distribution. The second assumption is that the variances of the two samples is the same. And the third assumption is that the observations are independent. So the normality assumption, we talked about the normality assumption last lecture. Uh, when you remember that we can uh, do a QQ plot to check if the two, uh, if the, the data follows a normal distribution. And we have here the normal quantiles and we can have the length of the error. And we see that it's about the same. We have one uh, outlier in uh, item number 12. So observation 12 seems to be a little bit of an outlier, but is still within uh, bounds, okay? And we can also compare of the new process. And the new process, we see that it's a little less normal. Of course, uh, the t-test, it has, it is um, robust to a little bit of variation, to some variation. So this is not very worrying for us, okay? But it's worth investigating this, uh, these outliers to see if it's not something special, if it's not some error that happened in our sampling method. Of course, we can also do the Shapiro test and we do the, Shap the Shapiro test for the new and the old. And we can see that for both cases, we cannot reject the new hypothesis that the sample comes from a normal distribution. Okay, so, okay, we ver verify the assumption of normality. Now, the assumption of equality of variances, we can uh, do a visual analysis of this by plotting the residuals. And what is the residual? Residual is the mean of the sample minus the value of each. So we here for the new, we have that the largest residual is three and the smallest residual is minus three. And if we remember that the mean of the new sample was seven, we can see that the largest difference is 11, like about a little bit more than seven, than seven. and the smallest one is about five. So about minus three to plus three. And the old is from minus two to minus two plus two. So there's a little bit of change in the variance, but they seem to be about the same. So we cannot really reject that maybe the variance is about the same. Uh, to test the, the variances, uh, the quality of variance, we have the Fligner test. So the Fligner test, uh, also in R, we do the error uh, explained by the process, and we got a p-value of 0 0.19. So we cannot quite reject the new hypothesis that the, both of the variances are the same, okay? All right, so finally, the assumptions of independence. And for the assumptions of independence, we talked about it last class. There is no general test for the independence assumption. It has to be guaranteed in the design phase. Okay, so what we do for that is that we try to make sure that uh, the, the size of the rods is not influenced by if the machines are hidden up. If it is, we can generate a very large number of rods like here we have 17 samples. We could generate 50 and throw away the samples in the beginning of the process and in the end of the process to just get the ones in the middle that are more stable. Or we can maybe just produce one rod per day uh, to make sure that it's always the same state, okay? Um, in the case that the variances are not the same, okay? so or sorry, in the case that we cannot assume that the variances are the same. Note that here we tested and we verified the assumptions that they are the same. So this is not necessary for this example, but in a more general case, you cannot know if the variances are the same or not, right? So in that case, we can estimate 
the, the variances uh, using a variation of the, the, the t-test called the Welch t-test. In the case of the Welch t-test, the statistic is calculated like this. So you see that instead of having a pooled variance, we have the, the variance of the first sample divided by the sample size and the variance of the second sample divided by the, se the sample size. Okay, And in this case, it will be a TV distribution. Uh, so the distribution is slightly different. But the, look at, the lucky thing is that, at least from the computational point of view, it's largely the same. Okay, So here, we can just set at in R, we can use the t-test var equation equal false, and it will use the Welch test. It's, as you can see here, it's saying that it's using the Welch test. In the previous slide, uh, not this one, you can see here that we are just using the t-test, and we are not using the Welch test. Okay, and we can see here that if we use the same data and we say that we don't know if the variances are the same or not, well, the p-value is still quite low and we still can reject the, uh, the new hypothesis. It's a little bit higher, so um, it assumes a little bit more of error. So there is, sorry, it's a little bit lower. It's a little bit, it's a little bit closer to the new hypothesis, but it's still far enough that we can uh, strongly reject the new hypothesis here, okay? So summary, uh, to compare an estimator from samples of two populations that we assume that follow a normal distribution, uh, we, will, we set our statistic and the corresponding hypothesis to the difference of the two target variables. This technique for comparison is, equally, is very simple. So you just put the two data there, okay? Now, uh, there are cases in where this approach does not apply. So now we're gonna see a relatively common case where using the difference of the target variables would lead to a wrong result, okay? So I'll take a quick break and we go to the next video that should be a little bit shorter. See you then.